is Laura Cohen. I am a distinguished clinical professor of law and the director of both the Criminal and Youth Justice Clinic and the Center on Criminal Justice, Youth Rights and Race at Rutgers Law School. Since 2005, the Criminal and Youth Justice Clinic has provided legal representation to clients who were wrongfully convicted of serious offenses when they were children and teenagers and are seeking to establish their innocence. In 1989, Hugh Burton, a high school sophomore, was living with his parents in the family home in the Bronx. He had never been arrested or charged with any offense. On a January afternoon, he came home from school to encounter a horrifying discovery, the body of his mother, 57-year-old Keziah Burton, who had been stabbed to death in her bedroom. Within 48 hours, Bronx detectives went from considering Hugh to be a victim of this crime to being the prime suspect. They picked him up, drove him to the local police precinct, placed him in an interrogation room, and proceeded to question him over the course of many hours. During that time, they isolated him. They refused to let him see his father, who was waiting downstairs. They assured him that if he confessed, he would be treated as a juvenile and allowed to go home. And they posed to him a narrative that suggested that if he admitted that he had killed his mother accidentally during an argument, he would be treated more leniently. Ultimately, Hugh's will was overborne and he falsely confessed to this crime. Ultimately, he was charged as an adult, tried in adult court, and sentenced to serve 15 years to life in prison. More than 38% of DNA exonerations of people who were convicted of crimes allegedly committed during adolescence or childhood involve false confessions. Nearly 70% of people who've been exonerated by DNA evidence are people of color. And of those, nearly 63% are black people. Contrary to widespread belief, false confessions generally are not the product of physical torture, duress, or abuse. Instead, they're obtained through the same standard police interrogation tactics that the police used in questioning Hugh Burton false promises of leniency, minimization of culpability, isolation, and deception about evidence. Why is this so? Well, developmental immaturity renders children and teens uniquely vulnerable in the interrogation room. For this reason, even older teens process and weigh the risks and benefits of decisions that they must make in a way that's profoundly different from adults. Children in police custody also are vulnerable to interrogation-induced stress, which further undermines their understanding and independent judgment. As early as 1948, the United States Supreme Court recognized these unique vulnerabilities of children. 72 years later, it is even more clear that enhanced legal protections are essential to prevent juvenile false confessions. These include, among others, prohibitions against police lying about evidence and false promises of leniency, video recording of all youth interrogations from the beginning of a young person's interaction with the police through the conclusion of the interrogation process, mandatory presence of a parent or other protective adult in the interrogation room, and perhaps most important, mandatory presence of and assignment of counsel for any child or teenager who is undergoing a police interrogation. Such measures are necessary, not only to protect the innocent, but also to ensure that the real perpetrators are, of crime are apprehended. For every time a person is wrongfully convicted, the real perpetrator goes free. Hugh Burton was exonerated in 2019. Countless others who falsely confessed to crimes when they were children remain behind bars, however. Robust protective measures are essential to keep our community safe and to ensure that other youth avoid a similar fate.